and I hope everyone is staying safe and well. Um, I'm really excited to take part in this conference um, because it's quite rare to have a space to speak a bit more frankly and honestly about data science and the ethical implications and the struggles that we encounter um, doing data science. So I'm also slightly intimidated because in the next 30, 35 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about a piece of research I did two years ago and the challenges I encountered uh, and how it contributed to changing the way I think about data science. So this is a brief overview of this session. I will start with an introduction and then I will move into the motivation and the context for the research. I will introduce the research aims and the constraints I faced, and then I will talk about the methods, the results, and discuss a bit um, the next steps, etc. And the lessons learned will be scattered all across um, the session. So starting with a brief intro, um, like Jesus men mentioned, um, I have kind of a mixed background. Um, and I'd like to, to speak a little bit more about this because I think it's quite um, helpful to understand where I'm coming from. Um, so working in international development for a few years as a policy researcher, um, I was uh, put in a position where I had to translate a lot of information, uh, do lots of readings, uh, literature reviews, and transform this information into digestible um, policy guidance for decision makers to implement new policies or change existing ones. Um, so it was a work that involved a lot of um, data in a way, but not data the way we think about it in data science. Um, I think um, it kind of taught me a lot about crossing large amounts of information and turning it into something much more digestible for decision makers. And this is important because when I decided to transition into data science, I walked into this new field with a strength, which was that I had been trained academically and professionally to um, think critically about data, um, to adopt you know, a certain level of um, healthy skepticism towards the data, to consider it as a social construct, um, because too often it's way too easy to be seduced by a pretty data set um, and to jump right into the analysis without questioning the data collection methods or the trustworthiness of the source. So that's a strength. But I also walked into data science with the handicap that, um, first of all, I had far less experience in data science than people my age. Um, and also because I had worked on water and sanitation, when I got the opportunity to work on water and sanitation from a data science perspective, I fell into the fallacy of thinking I had domain knowledge, which turned out wasn't exactly true. And I will speak more about this. So without further ado, uh, let's dive into the research in question. So this was basically the final dissertation for my geospatial analysis masters, which I completed in 2018 at UCL. The title is Mapping Risks of Fecal Contamination of Shallow Groundwater in Dakar, Senegal an evaluation of culture-based methods and a real-time technique using tryptophan-like fluorescence. So that's a very dry and long title, um, but basically it means that I was trying to explore the contamination of groundwater in Dakar using first-hand data that I collected and using the tools of geospatial analysis, which you can think of as a mix between GIS uh, and data science. I'd also like to make a, a little stop here to acknowledge the project partners um, because I was incredibly lucky to join um, an existing um, sponsored research project and to take part in the Afri Watsan initiative. So Afri Watsan is an academic consortium that brings together um, scholars and experts in water, sanitation and health uh, from Senegal, Kenya and Uganda. They have a network of three groundwater observatories. So you have one in a large mega city in West Africa, which is in Dakar, one in Kisumu in Kenya, which is a secondary town, and one in a more rural area, which is Lukaya in Uganda. So I was basically sent to Dakar for two months. And for most of that time, I was on the ground collecting water samples from the, um, with the local Afriwatan team. Um, from the Université Cher Antadiop de Dakar, so the local university. And uh, they provided incredible, tremendous support. Um, the professors, researchers, lab technicians, 
PhD and master's students. They were really instrumental in making the whole research happen. Um, so they deserve proper acknowledgement here. Now let me move um, to, towards um, explaining a bit the motivation and the context for this research. So the main motivation behind this piece of research and more broadly behind the whole Afri Watson initiative is that lack of sanitation remains a leading cause of mortality in sub-Saharan Africa. Globally, there's almost 2 billion people around the world that still drink water that has been contaminated with fecal matter. 1.8 billion, that's enormous. And this is because 39% of the population only use what we call safely managed sanitation infrastructure. What we mean by safely managed is that um, it's a sanitation infrastructure in which the excreta, uh, so the poop, is safely disposed of on site or, or it's uh, transported and treated off site with a sewer pipe system. And if we zoom on sub-Saharan sub Africa alone, uh, you actually get 643,000 deaths from diarrheal diseases each year. Again, gino ginormous number. Um, and this is in majority children under five. And this is due to the fact that 72% of the, of the population lack access to what we call at least basic sanitation services. That means that 72% of the population relies on open defecation or on some, so some sort of latrines that do not have a storage system, which means that the, the poop is not disposed of and it goes on and contaminates the groundwater or the surface water, basically the water on which the community relies for drinking, cooking, cleaning, etc. So this is a massive issue. It's, it's, it's huge. Uh, and if you're interested in this, I would really re um, recommend that you check out this report by the Joint Monitoring Program from UNICEF and the World Health Organization, where they explain a lot of these indicators. And it's pretty mind blowing. Now, how can we address this? It's obviously a huge issue, and there's many people trying to tackle it from different entry points. Um, there's no silver bullet, but as a start, one thing we can do is try to disrupt the way in which we detect the presence of harmful pathogens in groundwater. Harmful pathogens, um, they're I'm, I'm speaking about fecal bacteria, such as E. coli, which is the most famous one, and the more broad family of what we call thermotolerant coliforms. Those bacteria, they're responsible, they're responsible for the diarrheal diseases and the long-term health issues I mentioned earlier. Now, the problem is that traditional methods for detecting those bacteria, they've um, primarily relied on culture-based methods. So this is what you see he on, here on the left. Um, basically, um, it's the Petri dish method. Um, this is very reliable, but it has four big disadvantages. This method, this method is very costly. You need to use reagents. So that's a product that might not be available and that is costly as well. Uh, you need to incubate your Petri dish at a certain set temperature, I think it's 40 degrees, for 18 hours. So, so there's 18 hours before you can actually read the results. And you need the, a certain level of expertise and access to a certain level of logistics to be able to implement this method. Um, in our cases, we were underground collecting um, the samples in little water bottles that were sterilized. Um, but then we were carrying them in cooling uh, cool boxes. And they had to reach the lab within six or seven hours. Otherwise, it would just not be good anymore. And then we had to immediately do the, the Petri dish, incubate, et cetera. So those are a lot of constraints. And they're especially limiting in remote settings and in developing countries, which need this kind of analysis the most. So in order to address this, the British Geological Survey, which is um, yeah, a British institution in charge of um, exploring hydrogeology and all these issues, um, the BGS has been exploring ways in which a certain type of fluorescence could be used instead of the culture-based methods. This is what you can see on the right here. The big advantage of this method is that it's real time. You just have a sensor and a reader and you can read immediately um, 
the value that you're measuring. It is portable. As you can see, this is a bucket, and the whole set fits into a bucket. And it's easy to use. Anyone can be trained to use it. So you can imagine the potential that this kind of device could have on helping communities understand better whether their groundwater is contaminated and what they can do about it. Do they need to treat it, boil it, etc. The only issue at the minute is that it's still in its early, early stages of development, and we're not entirely sure about how it works. What we do know about how it works is that, like I mentioned, you get your fluorometer that's made of a sensor unit and a screen reader. You immerse your sensor in a pitcher of your sampled water. Then you cover it to make it dark. And basically, it will shoot a little laser beam that will measure the concentration of organic dissolved matter at a certain wavelength. Um, in this case, we were carrying two two devices. One was measuring, was measuring TLF, which is um, here. And one was measuring colored dissolved organic matter, which is uh, here. Um, and we had calibrated the devices back in the labs of the BGS in the UK. So the idea between this method is that we are trying to measure um, certain toxins that are produced by the fecal bacteria. It's not the bacteria themselves. The reason we're using this is that in previous work led by the BGS in Malawi, India, Zambia, and South Africa, they found that there was a strong relationship between this real-time method and the culture-based traditional method. Um, and when they were establishing a certain contamin contamination threshold of 1.3 particles per billion, they were getting an OK rela relation between the two types of measures, uh, except that it was producing 4% of false negatives and 18% of false positives, which is quite high. Now, as the last piece of my introduction, uh, let me tell you a bit more about the study area. So Dakar is home to almost 2.5 million inhabitants. And basically, um, this is a city center uh, which is quite developed. It has the institutions, the business district, etc. So it has tap water and a sewer system. But actually, most of the population lives here, uh, which is the Pekin and Gejiawai area. And um, these areas have developed very quickly um, in the past 20 to 30 years. Uh, and they've also there are also neighborhoods that that grew quite organically. So houses popped up a bit informally. So there is no planning. Definitely no planned infrastructure, and everybody in there relies on septic tanks. The problem is that the streets are also very narrow, and that the emptying trucks that are supposed to collect the content of the septic tanks cannot access it. So the tanks are never emptied, or people just dig a hole in the sand and pour the content of the tank in there. Now, I won't go into the details of the area's hydrogeology, but what you need to know is that it's just a very sandy area. It's all sand, and it's a very shallow aquifer. So basically, you've got six, seven meters deep, uh, deep of sand, and then you directly reach the groundwater table. And while sand can filter some of the largest impurities, it doesn't get rid of all the nasty particles like nitrates and certain bacteria. So as a result, as the area has been heavily urbanized and um, that we have this issue of septic tanks leaking directly into the, into the groundwater, the, the aquifer has become incredibly polluted. It's actually so polluted that the city gave up on treating it to produce uh, tap water to central Dakar. And instead they built a 100 kilometer pipe that takes water from the north of the country all the way um, to, to central Dakar because it's still less costly than doing the treatment needed to make the water here um, drinkable. Added bonus, um, because this is a city that's um, a peninsula surrounded by the ocean, you also have saline water infiltrations. That's, that's the bonus. So moving on to the research aims and the constraints I faced. So they were kind of two research aims here. The first one was for the BGS to test this TLF 
technique in a new type of environment, which is a highly polluted, densely populated area such as Dakar. The second research aim was to explore the contamination patterns in the Chiaroi Aquifer and to understand a bit how different environmental variables may play out into the contamination we observe. But in fact, my initial research proposal joining this project was slightly different, and I'll explain why in a minute. I was trying to understand the relationship between the false positive results we got, which remember it's 18% is quite high, um, and the different environmental variables. My idea was um, based on some pretty preliminary evidence that um, the VGS was suspecting that the presence of certain external factors like gasoline might be generating those false positives. So my idea was to gather various environmental variables like how far are you from the sea, um, where is the nearest petrol station, the nearest road, are there farms around, and try to figure out what could possibly be inducing those false positives. And then ideally, the final output would be a map um, of Dakar where you could actually see in which zones you could trust the TLF method to be giving you a reliable measure of fecal contamination. And because I used conditional all here, you probably guess that is not how it all went. So touching a bit upon the constraints I faced, uh, the first one was time because I started I, I arrived in Dakar mid-May and I had to submit my dissertation 31st of August 2018. So it was only four months uh, with some of the last um, hydrochemical analysis results arriving literally two weeks before the deadline. So it was short. Um, so when we speak about um, resource constraint, time was definitely constrained as well. Another one was internet connection, which was not stable. and um, that means I couldn't do as much Googling as I, usu as I usually do. Um, next constraint was definitely the logistics and equipment. Um, in Dakar, there was lots of tap water cuts, uh, including in the lab. So we had to do what we were supposed to do without water, which was quite challenging. Um, we also had very limited equipment available. Um, the the other hydrochemical sensors were usually a bit old and we didn't have the liquid for calibrating them. So it was a lot of um, difficulties that I only realized existed because I was there, but um, the team at UCAD has to live with um, every day and keep producing academic research with those very limited um, resources. A final constraint was the sampling pattern. And I will speak a bit more about that later. But basically, we could only sample where there was a source to sample from. So we couldn't do a beautiful grid of like, I'm going to sample every one kilometer. That sometimes you just couldn't access it. So you had to sample where you could. And so entire left areas were left out, which is a shame, but it's a constraint. So that leads me to my first lesson, um, which is try to plan for the unexpected because you plan your plan might be very straight and very simple i'm going to identify why there's false positives but then life will happen uh, the universe has plans for you so yeah if i could go back there's a few things i would do differently uh, including you know make sure making sure i have some offline help resources like downloading downloading um data science manuals so i don't have to rely on Stack Overflow that I can't access because I'm offline, things like this. Um, another thing I would probably do is put regular updates with my supervisor in the calendar because once it's there, it's easier to stick to it and it would ensure good progress. Now, moving on to the methods. Um, so this is the methods employed, um, starting with the field work. Um, 90 samples were collected with 48 parameters recorded. Um, the data was treated and prepared with some data extraction in QGIS. Um, and then there was some exploratory data analysis. And basically those three first steps were kind of mushed together and it was kind of all happening as I was trying to figure out what could possibly be going on with the data. And then finally some modeling 
um, and some, some classification because we want to be fancy. So data collection, like I said, 97 samples across the Dakar region, uh, sampled across hemp ups, uh, dog wells, piezometers, and a couple of boreholes. There are a lot of parameters. So basically, to summarize what this whole huge table is trying to tell you, uh, there's different types. Um, the first one is the GPS coordinates, date time. Second is the hydrochemical parameters that were recorded on site with various sensors, so like temperature of the water, its salinity, turbidity, etc. Then there were the, the readings on my two fluorometers, so TLF and CDOM. There were various tests that were carried out in the, tab, in the labs later on, like the culture-based tests, um, E. coli tests, total cell counts, nitrates, phosphates, etc. And then there's um, a bunch of uh, variables that I derived, um, such as distance to farm, industry, landfills, um, cemeteries, which were all um, elements that were highlighted in the literature as being um, as having a possible impact on groundwater quality. And then finally, you see here, cracks lose, pump incinitary is basically um, some indicators that were collected using, collected using a World Health Organization sanitary risk assessment form. And so it's just to measure if the source is sanitary. And we record this for every source. If you look at it uh, as a map, the, these are the location of the different um, samples. Uh, as you can see, there's lots of hand pumps and lots of dog wells. And here is uh, the data plotted by color, if it's contaminated or not. And you can start noticing that the sampling pattern is not very regular, like I mentioned earlier, and that there's also a lot of contamination going on. But it's not. There's no cluster, apparent cluster. It's it's quite difficult to see anything just from this visual check. And now this is the big reveal. This is when lesson one um, strikes, uh, the unexpected strikes. Uh, and the first um, part in this series was that uh, we were trying to figure out that TLF didn't seem to work, or rather. The, the numbers I was getting from measuring TLF, um, so this is the, the y-axis here, uh, was not correlated whatsoever with the, the, the count of bacteria I was recording in the labs in the evening. So that was a bit scary because it's the whole premise of the research that collapses. Um, and it turns out that there's an almost perfect absence of correlation. So yeah, that was a bit puzzling. And it's also a good time to mention that uh, in roughly a dozen cases, the readings on the TLF fluorometer were so high that they basically maxed out the, 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 the capacity of the reader. We just knew that there was a lot of particles being measured, but it was off the charts. Uh, and it, it happened in some cases that these readings were off the chart, but the source tested negative to any bacteria. So that was incre increasingly um, puzzling, and it was getting very hard to make sense of all these very strange results. And that's when it dawned, dawned to me that I probably didn't have the right domain knowledge. I couldn't understand what was happening. Another way of looking at this is with this um, admittedly quite confusing map. Um, basically, the color tells you if the TLF reading uh, was low, it's green. And if it was high, it's red. And then the size of the dots is about the, 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 the Petri dish, the, the culture-based results. And so in theory, in a perfect correlation world, there would be only small green bubbles and big red bubbles. And you can see that it's definitely not the case. Now, I would like to dump a second lesson, um, stay truthful, um, because there is a temptation to rearrange the data um, 
and I know this comic is about machine learning, but the reason I put it there is that someone very seriously advised me to just drop the points that didn't add up because, you know, like I had to preserve the hypothesis I was basing my, my research project on, which was quite shocking uh, a suggestion. And truth is, it would have made my life a ton easier and it would have made the last weeks leading to the to the dissertation deadline way smoother. But I think it's important to stay truthful to what you observe. And even if it doesn't match your hypothesis, then just go ask the, exper the experts. Now, second episode of the unexpected, uh, the rain. So now we are two thirds into our data collection when the rain hits. Uh, and it may sound like no big deal, but in Senegal, you only have two seasons, the dry one up to July, and then the wet season for two, three months. And the data collection was supposed to happen during the dry season, so that all points are comparable. And when they were collecting, and then we see this black sky, and five minutes later, we were stuck in the rain. And to, to illustrate what I mean by making the samples comparable, here you have a kennel that um, during most of the year is being used as a collective trash, although it's actually a canal that's supposed to drain water, rainwater into the ocean. So basically you had eight months worth of trash that were accumulating. And as we drove back um, after the rain, uh, we drove along the ocean and you could see that these canals were pouring all the content into the ocean. And so you can see this black oil spill looking like pollution that was actually spreading for entire kilometers. Yeah, so that happens. And it also happens more generally in the sand. So if there's trash lying around with the first rain, all the bacteria are actually going to get into the groundwater table or pass through the cracks of a hand pump. So yeah, that, that's why it mattered to make <laughs> those the, all the samples before the rain. But you know, you have to adapt. So we just decided, okay, let's just go back to certain sources we've already sampled and compare the two results. What we found out was that after the rain, the TLF rates were systematically lower than the first time, which seems to suggest a dilution effect. But then the, the, the actual contamination, the culture-based tests were higher, uh, up to 10 times higher than the first time, which points to an additional contamination of the shallow aquifer. This takes me to my third lesson, go ask the experts. You probably don't have enough domain knowledge uh, and you're probably gonna be like this guy who thinks that because he has data science, he can you know, change this team's work, but figures out that actually, well, there's a reason why people have been working on this project for years. Um, yeah, so I think at this stage, I was really lucky to be able to go knock on people's door and ask questions and get answers and be able to reformulate a new working hypothesis that I'm going to um, introduce now. Um, I think it's still important though to not take these people's time for granted and be respectful of the time that they can give you. Um, just don't free ride on, on them, but acknowledge that their expertise is very precious and that you need it. So this is my new working hypothesis, which is basically that after decades of pollution, the aquifer was very rich in debris and nutrients from past contamination. And this may lead to high levels of what we call dissolved organic matter, so like those debris. And they are probably what was interfering with my fluorometer readings. Now, a combination of other parameters may be useful to model the contamination across the aquifer. So I have a list of partial rec research questions, but I'm just going to go through them uh, now in the results section. So let's start with this one, which is kind of key, and we just mentioned the TLF method is not really working to model the contamination across this specific aquifer. In fact, we have an almost perfect absence of correlation. So yeah, be flexible. Um, it's OK to let go of the hypothesis that was most central to your whole research. It can feel incredibly disheartening. But this is also how science and data science work. Uh, and it's OK, 
as well to establish that some variables you lovingly um, you know, worked so hard to collect won't actually bring any useful information and that you should just discard them. Those are okay, just remain, remember to be flexible and to adapt. Um, so one of my sub research questions was to try and understand which were the main predictors of fecal contamination. One first visual way of checking it is with a correlation matrix. So I, I presume many people here are familiar with it, but basically if it's white, there's nothing, nothing to, to say. Um, if it's blue, the darker the blue, the stronger the correlation between two variables, the strong, the red, the the darker the red, the stronger the negative correlation between two variables. And here you have all the variables plotted against each other. So this gives us some indication already. Um, but now working with a very wide data frame, remember 48 parameters for only 97 observations, um, you may run into multicollinearity, which means that certain independent variables are highly intercorrelated. For instance, here the total risk, um, it's the sum of other risks like sanitation, cattle, trash, etc. So if you leave all these variables in, it might lead to an unstable estimation of the parameter values in the regression model. So it's important to let go of some variables. In this case, uh, it was done uh, by performing a stepwise logistic regression to reduce the number of significant parameters that we included in the regression model. And we're using the logistic regression because what we're interested in here is, is the water contaminated? Yes or no? So we don't really care how much it is. It's just a binary question. We, so we don't really need linear regression. Next, um, what are the predictive power? Oh, sorry, um, how do various environmental factors affect the reliability of the TL? T TLF. Um, these two plots were actually super interesting to the hydrogeologists because what they mean is that TLF is um, extracellular. So it's actually um, if you if you measure TLF in filtered water and in unfiltered water, it's the same. So we know that it's a very 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 tiny particle that is being measured and it's smaller than a cell, than a than a bacteria. Sorry. Um, and we also observe that it's correlated to this colored dissolved organic matter. So there is something about the debris. This is what we're measuring. And that supports the hypothesis that my fluorometer was actually reading the debris of a past pollution, an accumulation of past pollution, and not necessarily today's pollution, which is, again, quite big for people working on TLF. Um, what we also observed is that TLF is negatively correlated to the presence of uh, farming activities and that the, the TLF levels decrease um, with distance to cemeteries, industries, and landfills. And this could be due to specific compounds that are present around these facilities. But for now, it's impossible to conclude with this tiny data set. So further tests and controls will be needed. And I'm almost reaching the end here um, because, you know, um, I'm a geographer. Oh, sorry. Previous slide. Um, we, when we look at the logistic regression, um, we retain, we boil down the 48 parameters to a final set of nine significant variables uh, that minimize the root mean square error of the logistic regression. Um, and in this case, uh, our model, predictive power is not mind-blowing, but basically what this number tells you is that um, when you leave out an observation and you try to predict its contamination status based on the rest of the data set, it will reach a correct classification 72.22% of the time, which again, it's not mind-blowing. Finally, uh, again, this is a Geography dissertation, I was very keen to explore the spatial dimension of fecal contamination. However, it turned out that partly due to the erratic sampling pattern and in part due to the complexity of groundwater flows, um, 
we didn't find any spatial autocorrelation, which means that I couldn't do any interpolation. I couldn't do any spatial modeling of this um, of, of this pollution. Uh, for instance, this inverse distance weighting um, uh, here would be meaningless, actually. So this leads me to my final lesson. It's OK to use basic tools. It was frustrating for me to not be able to use geospatial tools, but there's no point in forcing it if it's not going to work, if it's not going to make sense. So when everything else fails, it can be a good idea to just turn to unsupervised classification methods to try and uncover any, un any hidden underlying pattern. And here with clustering, I did come up with three kind of coherent um, um, clusters, which, again, are not mind blowing but um, can teach us a lot um, down the line um, to inform what we look for when we go sample a certain source and what to focus your analysis on when you visit this um, type of water source from cluster one, two, or three. Final section, the discussion. Um, this research still matters even though it, wasn't, it was a bit frustrating um, because it helped further understand how TLF works. Uh, it also flagged its limitations, which is very important. You don't want to go around and uh, use this when you know it's not working. Um, and it also allowed to, to facilitate a skills exchange across the AfriWatson uh, network, uh, especially around R and QGIS. Uh, next steps will be to incorporate the groundwater flows, vertical and horizontal, into the groundwater pollution modeling. And that is already being done by the very talented uh, hydrogeologists at UCAD. Um, ideally, it would be great to improve the sampling scheme, but that's not going to be possible. And ideally, again, very difficult to get it. But if there was uh, any historical record of pollution and land use data, it would be very interesting to investigate whether historical loads of fecal bacteria are somehow related with what we measure today with TLF method. As a recap, by lessons learned, plan for the unexpected, stay truthful, no results is better than made up results. Ask the experts because you probably don't have enough domain knowledge, be flexible, and it's okay if you don't use fancy models and tools. Thank you for listening.